Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Linda, and I'm originally from Michigan, now living in the St. Louis metro area. I'm a college coach with School Match for You and have a daughter at University of Chicago. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a wellness coach at the Kenan Flagler Business School at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And I'm so blessed to be able to work alongside both my beautiful daughters at School Match for You, a college counseling firm that I founded in 2010. Good morning, friends. If you're new to your College Bound Kid podcast, I'm just going to take a little time today, something I rarely ever do, just to give you a little background on our podcast. First of all, our mission is to make college knowledge available to all. And we do it by providing 10 to 12 hours a month of college or college admissions content. Um, We're the only podcast that does that in the world. And we do it. We never miss, ever. We have podcasts on Christmas, on Thanksgiving, on New Year's. And we never repeat episodes. We just do a really deep dive. So if you're looking for a real deep dive into college or the college admissions process, uh, this may be the place. Now, our first five and a half years, we met every single Thursday. And then in June of 2022, we, we added the Monday episodes to go twice a week. And it started out as just a conversation with a mom that I'd worked with. Anika is her name. And you hear her voice still. If you wonder, what's that voice I hear on transitions? That's Anika. Shout out to James in Mississippi who had that idea when Anika stepped down after three and a half years. Can we keep Anika on in transitions? Great idea. Thanks, James. Uh, so, yeah, it was kind of idea of a of a counselor and a parent. I'd worked with Anika It turns out four times I worked with both of her kids uh, on their boarding school searches. And then I worked with both of her kids on their college searches. And then at the end of year two, Dave, a lifeline friend came in. So I thought, hey, we have a mom. Let's have a dad. But, you know, we do surveys and we did a survey and I was surprised how many college counselors were listening. So I thought, you know what, let's add some more college counseling experience. So. Lisa joined a team at the end of year two, start of year three, episode 172. Dave came on episode 105. You say, how do you know that? Well, we have 52 a week back then, so I just do the math. Dave started at the start of year three, 52 times two, 104. 105 was the start of episode three. Lisa ended after we started going all the way through this book I wrote, which you can get on Amazon if you're interested. It's called 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions. And we used to have five parts. Can you believe it back then? We had a book chapter discussion where we went chapter by chapter through the book. And when we got to the end, I was going on and on and on about the future. And Anika was like, oh, I thought we were stopping at the end of the book. And I'm like, no, I'm not stopping. This is fun. And she's like, oh, I didn't know I signed up for a lifetime contract here. So we decided to to part ways, but we're still really, really close. And she's an awesome person. Uh, But anyway, we had this research that showed from our surveys that lots and lots of college counselors were listening. So like, okay, we need some more college counseling experience. So Lisa was great. Um, I got to know her and working with her and her oldest daughter and really gelled with her, had a lot of respect for her. And she was both a parent and a college counselor. And then she also had kids coming up in different divisions, now middle school, high school, and about to be a college grad, grad school. So just representing lots and lots of different perspectives. So Lisa joined our team. And it's been on ever since episode 172. But then when we decided we were going to go to twice a week in June of 20, 2022, I'm like, okay, that's just going to be way too much unless we expand our team. So we said, let's bring in more counselors with more admissions experience and placement experience. People that have been on both sides of the aisle. So it really does give you good insights if you've done counseling and placement in different capacities. So June of 2022, Julia 
brought Julia on from Boston, Susan from Pennsylvania, but Susan and I had worked together since 2002. We also brought in Vince from California, who'd either been at a reader or done admissions at six different places and uh, been on the placement side. So lots of experience, uh, lots of experience there. And then Linda also joined at the end of that year from Missouri. So um, giving us a different perspective. She's, you know, she says St. Louis, but it's really more in the hinterland. So uh, she can really help us uh, with a rural perspective and also really been involved in that tech world. And so it gives us somebody with a real strong kind of CS engineering background. Uh, very helpful there. And then at the end of 2022, we also decided to add Colorado College as a partner college. That's why you see them on at least four or five times a year, if not more. So that's just a little bit of background. So I'm excited today, July 7th. It's exactly 60 days away from me landing in L.A. for a 24-day trip to California, which is going to be the trip of a lifetime as I uh, visit students um, at all the colleges in California. Also, our national conference is in Los Angeles for three days. And because our listeners are so awesome, three different listeners reached out in three parts of the state to say we'd love to do a reception. So uh, by next Monday, that should be up on our website. But we do have confirmed dates uh, for two of the three, and I'm hoping we can confirm the San Diego one by Monday. But we'll definitely be in Santa Monica on the 22nd of of uh, September, which is a Sunday from one to four. It's going to be more of a drop in, pop in kind of uh, uh, no program. Just, you know, if you have 15 minutes, pop in. If you have an hour, pop in. And uh, Susan will be there. Vince will be there. And I will be there. And uh, we're, we're really, really excited about that, you know, and we'll have more details um, coming up on that on the, yeah, the 19th of September will be in that Palo Alto, Fremont area. And that one will have a little bit more of a program to it. Um, I'll have more details up um, on the website by next Monday. And I'm hoping to confirm the San Diego date, time and place by Monday as well, because we all know how fast two months goes by. But before we get to that, we have something even sooner. We have our July webinar on how admissions decisions are made for homeschool students. Nine days away. Nine days. Liam Daly, he's a homeschool liaison at Beloit College. He'll be there. He also was homeschooled himself. He'll be joined by two college counselors who specialize in working with homeschool students, uh, Dr. Michelle Levard and Holly Ramsey, who are also good friends. That'll be 830 Eastern, 730 Central, 630 Mountain, 530 Pacific. And that is on Tuesday, July 16th. So you sign up by just going to yourcloudsboundkid.com forward slash events. Can't miss the sign up form. If you put your questions in when you sign up, they will be prioritized. If we have time, we'll get to questions that come up actually on the event. But the last couple of times we haven't been able to get through all of the questions. We just do our best. But your, your questions will be prioritized if you put the questions up when you sign up. And while you're there, sign up for Matt Carpenter, which is just three weeks after the homeschooling a webinar. Um, also 8.30, also a Tuesday, August 6th, less than a month away. And that'll be the first 30 minutes. Any question you all you have on paying for college, the last 30 minutes, any questions you have at all on how to use College Aid Pro to figure out what your actual cost would be for the colleges on your students list. So those are a couple of events we have coming up. No webinar in September, uh, but we will resume in October. And many great options, just uh, trying to decide which of the great options we have. Um, but that decision will be made pretty soon and we'll be able to announce the October one, uh, certainly before July is over. So today, continuing with the theme of missed opportunities, missed opportunities, these are all things that come from the counseling room that I have experienced. And I would frame these as things people either do and they regret that they do, they've done, or as we say, sort of in church, sins of omission, things they don't do and they regret that they didn't do it. Now, I know what some of you are probably thinking. Do you have to word it so negatively? Why not just say great things to do in the college process? Why do you have to frame it as missed opportunities? All right, I'm going to be totally transparent with you. I just have learned that phrasing things like that generates more interest. 
You know, when you go to YouTube, and you can try this for your own city. I'm a big YouTube person. YouTube University, as my former colleague at Kip dubbed it. It is YouTube University. You go to YouTube, put your city in, and it's actually an interesting way to get a perspective on any city, to be honest, whether it's your city or a city that your student is looking at maybe going to, and put in videos that say, you know, things people hate about X city. Oh my goodness, you'll see all kinds of videos. And why do realtors do those? Because they get a tremendous amount of clicks. And then they usually have a little spit at the end that says, but I love it here and it's great living here. If you're interested in working with me, here's my contact. And they're sort of showing their transparency. Look, I'm totally real with you. Don't you trust me, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'll tell you another thing. The first, I don't know, 300 episodes we had on here, I never really cared that much what the, what the title was. I really didn't I caption the title. But one day I decided to go in and look at the statistics. And what I noticed was, and I know what some of you are going to think, especially if you're in like journalism or marketing or advertising, it's going to be a big duh. I noticed that when you had a catchy title, we really got a lot more people that downloaded that episode. So I don't know if you've ever noticed, but there's no consistency, especially on Thursdays. Sometimes the title is the interview. Sometimes the title is the question from a listener. Sometimes the title is the in the news article. And sometimes the title is the call spotlight. Well, what determines the title? What determines the title is what I think the listeners would be more likely to click if they see it. So I'm kind of getting a little more savvy, but I was a little, I don't know, green, naive, whatever you call it. So I've just learned that when you, nobody wants to miss an opportunity. So when you phrase it as missed opportunities, you generate a little buzz. So the missed opportunity I'm going to talk about today is mostly for divorced parents, separated parents, never married parents, but it also applies to currently ma married parents as well, grandparents and step parents. So everybody. And then we'll have part three or four of Linda's excellent interview with Colonel Robert Kirkland looking at what the service academies look for in their admission process. And I love this interview. I've said it before. I may have learned more from that interview than any interview that's been done on here before because it's very detailed. It's very explicit. And, you know, they reveal a lot more than your typical highly selective school that does holistic admissions does about their actual process. It's also an area I don't have a ton of experience with. I have worked with students that have gone to the Coast Guard Academy, Naval Academy, but it's less, less than 10 students in my whole entire career I've worked with that have gone to any of those service academies. It's like four to the Coast Guard Academy, two to the Naval Academy, nobody to the Air Force or to West Point. It's just not in my wheelhouse of experience. Um, all right, let's dive right in uh, with the missed opportunities. So I'm just going to start right out with the upshot here. Parents have to get on the same page when it comes to a multiplicity of decisions their student is going to make about college. And some of my most painful memories in my 25 years I've been doing this happened because this never happened. And while it's especially true for divorced, separated, and never married, it's also true for current marrieds, step parents, and grandparents. So the reason why it happens more often with divorce, separate, and never married is because it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. So what happens there is one parent is usually calling all the shots, you know, because that's the who the other parent, you know, unless it's a joint custody thing, then not necessarily as much where they're like 50-50, but normally there's still a lead, you know, in those situations. And so one parent just gets used to making all the decisions, usually the mom. Um, who tends to drive the educational decisions, but not always the mom. It's probably the dad about one in five times. But then what happens is that the other parent comes into the picture and they have a diametrically different perspective. And I've seen this create all kinds of, you know, trepidation and agina and dissentment. It's bad. And it just can create massive fracturing and divisions with families. So I just want to share some of the areas just to pay acute attention to where I have seen the most disagreement. So I've seen a lot of disputes arise over distance from home, like how far are we going to let the baby go? And sometimes it's not just distance. Sometimes it's like location. Like a lot of families are really sensitive to 
are you close to a major airport? Because maybe you're far away, but can we get right in and get there? Versus, you know, you got to get in and then you're a couple hours away from the college. Um, so that's something distance from home. And it's hard, right? You've had your baby in in the nest for a long time. And now it's already scary letting them go. But letting them go 20 hours away feels a lot scarier than three hours away or six hours away. Somewhere where worst case scenario, I can hop in my car and I can get there in one day. But now everybody's on the same page on that. So that's really um, an area where I've seen contention. Another is just the college list in general, what schools you should even be applying to. And then another is the role of prestige. That's kind of related to the college list. And I'll say more about that later. But, you know, certain schools, quote unquote, not being good enough for our student. Um, I've seen definitely some tension there. Um, I've seen a lot of tension around college major. Um, A lot of tension around college major. And I understand that because, you know, it just goes back to this fundamental debate. Is college all about preparation to get a job? And if it is, I'm making a big investment. You know, I literally read an article this weekend. All 10 of the highest paying majors right now are STEM majors, all 10. So that kind of leads to, you know, people sometimes going that direction. But then others feel like college is not just you know, transactional. It's not just about getting a job. It's about developing the life of your mind. It's about figuring out who you are. It's about meeting interesting people. It's about developing your network. You know, it's about developing your whole critical thinking skills, communication skills, and just having different unique life experiences that form a foundation for you for the rest of your life. So not everybody sort of agrees on the the process of how much the salary should play a role in the choice of the major. But the more colleges go up in cost, the more that is just a basic ROI. I can't justify it if I don't see it. And that's, so it's, that's a lot. One thing that's changed a lot in the 25 years I've been doing this and it's understandable. The more you pay for anything, the more you expect. And then another thing I've seen differences over is the composition of the student body. That's a very broad term, but in, it's all encompassing, right? So this can come into play in a lot of ways. So the composition of the student body could be something like, I'm not happy with how few Jewish students are there or, you know, how few South Asian students are there or Latino or, or black students. So it could be like racial ethnic. It could also be the income of the students. And that could be either way. Some people might want a wealthier student body. Some people might want more socioeconomically diverse student body. You know, it could be everything from there's not enough international students. And then it can also be other aspects of the composition of the student body. But that's one you see. And then college size, too small, too big. Safety, which is more kind of in college culture school culture, I'll put it in that category because you can see stuff in school culture. Safety can be a factor. Also, how kids dress. Composition of the student body could also be their political alignments, political affiliations. These are all things people can feel very, very strongly about. But I would say all of those, add them all up and put them on one side of the ledger. And then there's another thing I haven't mentioned yet. It might be be more than the sum total of all the times those things are a conflict. So quiz, before I reveal it, are you thinking about what it is? Do you know what the biggie is? All right, the big reveal. Doe, box, moolah, greenbacks, or green. Yes, we're talking money. It is a really, really thorny issue, and understandably so partly because people love their money. So you're talking about parting with something that's really valuable uh, to you and not everybody being on the same page. Not everybody being on the same page of how much we're willing to pay for college, how much we're willing to pay for that college, how much we're willing to pay for or what we expect our student to do, loans, no loans, work, no work, work in the summer, work during the school year, how much work. I'm not going to go too much into that because a few weeks ago I did 50 questions about paying for college that you need to all get on the same page about. But I want to talk to you about where I see the conflict the most. About 180 colleges in this country 
that require the CSS profile, the college scholarship search profile. It's a college board product. And if you're applying for financial aid, these schools require that. Now, why do they require it? They require it because, just to be blunt, it's more it's more detailed and more accurate almost always than the FAFSA. It doing a complete thorough analysis and assessment of the income and the assets of the family, students and parents. So why the why there's 180 and not everybody is because not that many schools have enough need-based aid to really be generous with their need-based aid. So a lot of schools are going to charge you a number that they need to charge you in order to bring revenue and to pay their bills. And if it doesn't meet your need, well, suck it up, buttercup. Like you got to find a way to make it happen. That's what loans are for or hit grandma up or something. But there are these other schools, they have large endowments, large endowment per students, and they're really trying hard to give a lot of need-based aid away. You know, you'll hear schools say we meet 100% of demonstrated financial need or calculated financial need. Like these are these schools. And even some of the schools that don't meet 100%, but maybe they meet 90% or 95%, um, they will require the CSS profile because they're going to give away a lot of need-based aid. And they want to make sure that they give it to people who need it the most. And the pro the FAFSA just has too many loopholes for some savvy person to get around. And so for these schools, it's particularly important. You're like, Stuck, why are you going on and on about the CSS profile? Like, what does this have to do with anything? The reason why it rears its head so much with the CSS profile is, and I know I'm getting technical here, but it's important. A large number of these 180 schools also require the non-custodial parent to fill out the, the, the profile. In other words, even if you are never married, separated, or divorced, and rarely involved in the life of your student, you still have to fill out the forms and pay your fair share. Now, this can create all kinds of problems. First thing it creates is that one person feeling like I'm not paying. And that literally can just absolutely kill your ability to get financial aid at a school. Because from a school's perspective, we don't have a, we can't hire a team of lawyers to investigate this. And the easiest way in the world for us to be dead in the water is for every family out there that's never married, separated, to divorced, for the word on the street to say, all you have to do is say that the one parent doesn't want to do it. We can't survive that. Like we would need multi millions more in our budget to say, okay, no problem. Sure, we'll do it. And then word would spread. And while some people are ethical, other people, that's that's a lot of money. All I need to say is I don't, I'm not going to do it as a never married, separated, or divorced. Then maybe I'll say I'm not going to do it. That could be hundreds of thousands of dollars for my kid. To, way too big of a risk to take. So then these schools require that. And they literally will not give you financial aid unless you complete that non-custodial parent profile for the CSS profile. And then that just literally there's problems and problems and problems and problems. I've had so many problems over this over the years. You know, it starts with uh, one parent thinking the other parent's going to see all their finances. Now they have created a system where they're siloed and you don't see the finances. But then you have the problem of just resistance. I'm not paying. Um, you also have the resistance of, I maybe I'll pay a little, but I'm not going to pay what they want me to pay. You got that problem. And literally, as soon as I find out that somebody needs financial aid and it's never married, separated, divorced, I'm delving deeply into this because I've just been burned too many times. And it's, it's a lot better to just deal with it on the front end. So friends, I've said before that these are our concerns for never married, separated, and divorced. But these exact same things are things current marriage have to also wrestle through and think about. And I'm not just talking about the money, although that's a big one. Distance from home, location, college list, role of prestige, college major, student body composition, college size, school culture, and of course, cost. So I'm, I'm going to share something literally from this year. This was a disagreement over the role of prestige was going to play. And I could really see from my meetings that mom and dad were just not on the same page at all. 
And dad had gone to a very prestigious college, one of the most prestigious ones in the world. He saw great value to that. That mom had not done that. And she did not see great value to that. She thought she had turned out perfectly fine. And I didn't have to go where he went to have a great experience. And dad was mostly out making the money all the time. So he rarely attended meetings. Mom initially attended quite a few meetings with their student, but then toward the end, it was always the student only. But I was having a meeting with mom and student, and I said, listen, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page because, you know, I'm picking up that you all have a very different perspective when it comes to how important the name recognition of the school is. And I'll never forget what this mom said to me. She simply said, I don't know what to tell you. My husband's a school snob. But at least we were talking about the issue and we could address it and deal with it head on and take into consideration what role that was going to play um, in the college list. And I could decide when was I going to push back and when was I going to just accept the fact that it is what it is. So much better than getting hit with a hammer down the road. And we could have maybe shaped the college list a little different. And all that, the situation worked out really well. I'm not going to say any more details because you just never know who's listening. And I don't want anybody to ever be able to figure out who I'm talking about. So um, I'm just going to leave it at that. But it can impact impact currently married and people can have really strong uh, views on these things. And then there's uh, another group that you have to be careful with. And I encountered this one twice this year. And it's grandparents. Grandparents, you're thinking, what does grandparents have to do with anything? They're not in the house. Well, sometimes grandparents carry a big stick in this process. And I've seen that come out in a number of ways. Sometimes the grandparents actually paint a big chunk and they want to have some say in, in, in the college. Or, or at a minimum, the parents feel fear that the grandparents are going to have some say. Oh, I don't know if grandma's going to like that or grandpa's going to like that. The sense the parent feels is that the grandparent's not going to be impressed with the name recognition or what they regard as the caliber of the school. And um, that's also tricky when, when that comes up. Because sometimes I don't know if it's a parent that just wants to please a grandparent. Because remember, we all never really stop wanting to make our parents proud of us. So sometimes I literally have a parent that feels like, I don't think my mom or my dad is going to be happy with that choice. And unfortunately, a lot of people do see where the kid goes to college as an indictment on their parenting. And so ipso facto, I think I'll be seen as not being a good parent if I let my student go to that school. Um, so I don't know if it's that or if it's just the fear, the fear of parent intervention. So there's a lot to unpack in those situations. And then the other time when I see this is with step parents, and that can get really, really tricky because with step parents, sometimes you're navigating, you're navigating the biological parent and the step parent, you know, and sometimes there's situations where they're both really involved. I had two very sticky situations like that this year where you have the, the newly remarried parent in the home, and then the biological parent out of the home, but actively involved, and then the biological parent being like, this is my student, okay? Like, I birthed this student in my womb, like, I'm going to have some say in this thing. But then the remarried parent um, is also involved and oftentimes playing a role in pain, a portion. And so they feel like they can have some say. So those things can get sticky. One of the stickier situations I had was when I was director of cost counseling at KIPP. So this was a couple of local families, and one was quite prominent, actually, in Atlanta. And um, I can't remember if this, this was kind of a long time ago, like almost a decade ago now. But I can't remember if that this was a divorced or never married. But either way, it's sort of the same dynamics, whether you're divorced or never married. But I talked to mom, I get a totally different perspective. I talked to dad, I totally get a different perspective. And, you know, you kind of learn, right? There's like, you're not getting all one side when you hear from one parent. So at one point I said to dad, you know, this isn't working very well because I'm hearing something very different from you versus mom. 
Um, I would like all of us to meet in the room. This is like in-person counseling because this is school-based counseling. And just kind of talk through some of these things. And then dad says, I will not be in the room with that woman. Sometimes you hear things in the counseling room you never forget. So I'm not trying to say these things are easy. They can get very messy. But you've got to address the issues now uh, because it's so much worse. Uh, if you're doing it later. So if you're a college counselor and you're listening, hopefully this was helpful. If you're a current parent and a current student, hopefully this was helpful for you too, because whether or not you're divorced or never married or separated or step parents or active grandparents, even as parents got to get on the same page on all of these issues, it will make life so much better. It's worth going through the process to work through these things now to save yourself the migraines in the future. So that's the missed opportunity, getting everybody on the same page on some of the major things where there can be differences of opinion. Hopefully you guys found this helpful. We'll now transition to Linda's excellent interview with Colonel Robert Kirkland. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, in part three of four of Linda's interview with Colonel Robert Kirkland, Rob starts out by explaining how each congressperson can ask for different letters of recommendations. Then Rob explains how the admission process is separate from the congressional approval process. Rob talks about the physical fitness evaluation process. How is it administered? Who does the evaluation? And how are the results communicated to the service academies? Rob explains the five exercises that are involved in the fitness assessment. And he tells us which of the five is the most dreaded exercise. Rob talks about how the service academies view sports. Rob talks about what is involved in passing the medical exam. And Rob shares some landmines that students have difficulty overcoming that automatically disqualify them when it comes to the medical exam. Rob talks about how the military looks at programs like Sea Cadets, Young Marines, JROTC, and Civil Air Patrol. And finally, Rob talks about how the service academies see a student that attends summer seminar. Listen and enjoy. Those letters of recommendation for the congressional nomination, who is writing those letters of recommendation? The student gets to choose teachers to do that. Um, And is that more of a typical narrative kind of letter of recommendation? It's a typical uh, narrative letter of recommendation, but it really depends on your member of Congress. So each member of Congress has different criteria that they ask for regarding um, uh, letters of recommendation. So some members of Congress may ask for um, a specific teacher, like a math or science teacher, like the academies do. Others may just say, you know, give me two letters of recommendation. So it's important that when you're applying that you follow the directions and the of the application instructions of the particular member of Congress that's in your district, uh, so that you make sure you follow their their uh, requirements. They're not uniform. Uh, each member of Congress uh, does things uh, differently. So it just all comes back to it depends. Those congressional applications uh, for the nomination. Do the academies see those? Do they become part of the application to the academy? No, they do not. Uh, The the nomination is completely separate from the, uh, from, well, yeah. So, so the, 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 you have to fill out an application for the service academy. So the service academy has its own application process. So you have to provide essays, you know, teacher evaluations, transcripts, very similar to what you would provide to the to your member of Congress for the nomination process. So all that the Academy gets uh, is they get notified by the member of Congress that this person has received a nomination from me. And then, you know, either through the competitive process or the principal process. So that's all that generally the member of Congress gives. In other words, they say, this person has permission to be considered for admission. And so at that point, then the academies then take their own application that the that the person has filled out to determine whether or not they admit that student. Got it. 
to discrete processes. Um, let's talk about the the athletics um, because I have talked to a, a couple of kids and um, you know it's push-ups. I can't do the push-ups, so there's no way I am going to apply to you know uh, West Point. What what does that the fitness piece of it look like? What is that? Uh, what is the criteria? Who is administering that assessment? Is that something they do at their high school? Right. So the um, physical fitness test is generally given uh, usually up to about October of the person's senior year. So once the second part of the application opens up over the summer, that will then allow the candidate an opportunity to take the physical fitness test for the service academy. And so the service academy has uh, general criteria that they um, are general people, they, they des- people that they designate that are, are give, that can give this test. So it is, um, most candidates get it done by a physical education teacher at your high school. So it can't be a coach. Uh, it's got to be a person who has, who has a phys- physical education background because sometimes some of your coaches, you know, may be like the business teacher in your high school may not may not you know have the background to you know to be able to give a test like this so it's a physical education teacher is what the vast majority of candidates do so what they do is they on the application they designate who their physical education teacher is and then with the email and then the academy emails the um the p the physical education teacher with like directions on how to administer the test and then uh, putting in the scores and then those scores, then uh, the phys ed teacher sends the scores to, to the academy. Uh, so, um, so it's mostly phys ed teachers. It can be some other people. Like uh, if you have a, a military officer who's on active duty, they can give the test. If you're in a junior ROTC program, your instructor for junior ROTC can do the test. But, but for most candidates, it's your physical, physical education teacher that, gives that um, gives that test to the uh, to the candidate and and what kinds of activities do you have to do is it running is it the dreaded push-ups um, what does that look like yeah actually the most dreaded um, the dreaded exercise is a pull-up so that is oh, actually the sure. most dreaded, that is the most dreaded uh, one um, so the uh, so there's five different exercises that you have to do uh, in a particular, it's in a particular order, in a particular uh, time uh, between the testing, between each each test. So the test is a uniform one where everybody has to do it in, in this particular order with the amount of rest in between uh, each event so that there isn't, you know, one student who has an advantage over another student. So generally, the, the well, the, the the exercises are the pull up, or um, women can uh, either do pull ups or flexed arm hang, which is where they where they pull up to the top of the bar and have to hold their chin above the bar for a particular period of time. Uh, for a woman, uh, you should definitely try to do pull ups since you get more points for pull ups than than the flexed arm hang. Uh, men don't have the option to do the flexed arm hang. You have a basketball throw where you have to be a kneeling and you throw a basketball over your head and a cert- you throw it a certain distance and that's measured. There's the push-ups and the sit-ups that you talked about, um, you know, that you mentioned the, the, the push-ups earlier. That's part of that. There's also a 330-yard uh, shuttle run where you've got to go back and forth between cones. It's sort of like a sprinting event. And the final uh, test is the one-mile run. I'm getting throwbacks to that presidential fitness test that we had to go through in school, probably dating myself with that. Um, And then you mentioned athletics. And because there's such an emphasis on leadership, are they really looking for students who have participated in team sports versus you know, maybe something that you would uh, do solo. I'm thinking maybe like a martial arts versus basketball kind of thing. Right. So they see um, team sports as a very, very important component because they believe that, you know, being a part of a team is a very, is, is 
beneficial that you learn life lessons and, and working with others in a team like environment is, is, is beneficial alongside with, alongside the, you know, obviously the, you know, the athletic and physical uh, benefits of, you know, doing, uh, doing sports. So sports are, are very important for the academies and, and, um, you know, while being in, you know, martial arts is certainly, you know, if, if it's competitive and you're part of a team, uh, that certainly, you know, can, um, uh, I think can be more, uh, can give you more weight than just simply say, just doing martial arts on your own. Um, you know, that any, any sort of thing that you're doing, that you're part of a team and you're helping others and you're, and you're competing against others, um, you know, in, in, in athletics, uh, will be beneficial and will, uh, increase your profile. Let's talk about, um, the, the medical clearance. I believe they have to go through that. And what are they looking for? What are common disqualifications? Right. So that is, um, you know, that's, can sometimes be a landmine for some candidates. So, so, you know, you can be a, um, obviously have a fantastic scholar athlete leader profile, but if there's a particular medical uh, issue that you have, that could disqualify you from being, uh, from accepting an admission to a service academy because you actually, you won't be offered an admission to a service academy unless you pass the medical exam. And so, um, the medical exam consists of a survey you have to fill out that asks you medical questions, and then you go to a um, a civilian doctor that the military um, designates. It's usually like a local uh, doctor that is contracted by the Department of Defense that is in your local area. So you go through a medical exam and a vision exam. And so the survey, along with the medical exam and and uh, the uh, the vision test go for evaluation. And so, um, so basically, uh, you know, if you're, you know, if you have, if you're in good physical health and there's no major issues, you should be able to get um, uh, cleared medically, but there are some landmines, for example. So let me just give you several that um, some candidates, um, you know, uh, have difficulty trying to overcome. One would be like things like um, at, like severe allergies. If you have like allergies to like food, like peanuts, things like that, uh, that is disqualifying. So you can't be, you know, have, uh, you can't be allergic to things, you know, to food allergies. If you have asthma, you know, where you have to use an inhaler, um, that can be disqualifying. Uh, if you have like, you know, significant physical limitations, obviously that's, that's going to disqualify you. Some of the other uh, things would be like um, medications. If you're on like antidepressants or you're on like ADHD medication, uh, that can be uh, disqualifying. Finally, if you're required to do it, if you're, if you have a 504 plan or an IEP where you have to get, where you're allowed to take additional time on tests, that can be disqualifying also. So there's a lot of things, you know, that that maybe a regular college or university would be fine with that the service academies would not be okay with. Now, some of these um, disqualifications I've talked about, you can you could get a waiver from the individual service. So so like for example, with the um, ADHD medication, if you you know go off that medication when you're a senior in high school and you get a letter from your uh, doctor that states that, you know, you didn't take the medication or that's, or you have minor ADHD issues that could be wavered by the service. But uh, in general, um, you know, if you're taking medication and, and are required to take medication uh, to, you know, to maintain, you know, your, a normal functioning life, that can be disqualifying. So, so it, I can, first of all, see how those would be landmines. Um, and, good to find out that information before you get too deep in the process. When you're talking about like ADHD medication, so is the issue the medication or is it the ADHD? The issue is more medication. If you need medication in order to be able to control your ADHD, uh, then that's disqualifying. It's more like 
the, it's more of the medication, but it can also be the diagnosis of ADHD. So, so it's really, um, you know, obviously this is, <clears throat> you know, for a waiver of these um, issues, you know, the services, the service, whether it's Army, Navy, or Air Force is going to consider the whole candidate, you know, the, 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 me- the whole medical issue. And that's going to be, they're going to ask you to provide medical documentation um, for the particular issues. So, you know, you'll provide them the medication um, history, you know, the evaluation from your doctor. Uh, so all of that will be taken into account. So they're just, they're also looking for the severity of it too, you know, is how severe is this ADHD and, you know, and how much medication do you need to do to make, to, to, um, to, uh, you know, allow to make you functional. So, um, and I think oftentimes that, that is lost on parents. Like when I talk to parents and I have to explain to them that, that, you know, that, if your child needs a 504 plan, um, then that's disqualifying. And they kind of are a little um, bit taken aback by that. Um, you know, they make statements like, well, they're 50% of the students in my high school are on 504 plans and have to take additional time on tests. So, you know, I understand that. But but the thing is, is in the military, as you know, you know, the, the enemy is not going to give you additional time if they're, you know, if they're, you know, if you have, you know, uh, if you, you know, are leading soldiers, right. sailors, air marines, or, you know, you're going to be deployed to areas that are austere. And so they say, well, why can't, you know, why is it that, you know, my son or daughter has a peanut allergy? Why can't they serve? Well, I said, well, you could be deployed to a place like Afghanistan or, you know, or other places like that. And, you know, you may have to eat the local food. You know, there's not uh, <clears throat> that you, 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 the, the the military can't be concerned that and your soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines that you're leading can't be concerned that their leader is going to go into medical issues if they don't eat a, a particular diet or something like that. So there's there's military reasons why these medical um, standards are in place. Makes total sense. Uh, and keeping in mind that the academies really are a pipeline to to our military. You mentioned um, junior JROTC in high school. Do programs like that or Civil Air Patrol? Do, I know they give students uh, a kind of a, a taste of what life would be like. Do they? Does that help their application? Do the academies look upon that favorably? Yeah, they they do. I mean, any any sort of um, thing that you do that uh, that uh, shows military propensity can be helpful. So JROTC programs in high school show that you're uh, attracted to the military life. Civil Air Patrol uh, is another example. Um, sea Cadets, Young Marines, um, uh, organizations like that show that you're interested in the military. That you're that you are used to a military like environment uh, in high school, and that can certainly uh, help your application. Now, are summer seminars held at the academies? Is that kind of fall in that same category? Give you a taste of what it's like? Yeah, I w- I would encourage uh, candidates so you to candidates to apply to the summer seminar if they're interested in going to an academy. Uh, those uh, applications are generally uh, their their deadlines are around the first of the year between your junior and senior year of high school, and those seminars are usually for about five to seven days long in June uh, in the June timeframe. So uh, those seminars for the candidates are going to be seniors in high school are happening right now or or have happened over the last few weeks, and so yeah, I mean it gives you a taste of of the academy, uh, you know, gets you to kind of further commit to, you know, to, to uh, going into the military and, um, you know, can be mentioned on your applications and your essays as, you know, things that you experienced. Um, if you're unable to attend uh, a, a summer seminar, then, you know, you're, it's, it's not disqualifying. Um, as a matter of fact, academies have, have said straight out that 
if you have to choose between, say, something like Boy State or, or Girl State versus uh, a summer seminar, they recommend you go to Boy State or Girl State rather than the summer seminar because they, you know, they they see this as, you know, as a as as a, as a good thing going to summer seminar. But they realize that some candidates because of, you know, because of other interests that they have, or maybe because of a job or family issues may, may not be able to get to a summer seminar. So, so while they, you know, certainly like people going to the, the seminars, that is only one of many things that they consider in, uh, in, in their admission of a candidate. Friends, this concludes part three of four of Linda's interview with Colonel Robert Kirkland. We hope you join us next week for the final part. Friends, on Thursday's episode, Jude and I will continue with the two-part and final part of our conversation about Jeff Zelengo's New York Magazine article about what parents are doing to deal with college costs these days. We'll then continue with our roundtable. That's right. Vince from California, Hillary from Colorado, Julia from Massachusetts, Susan from Pennsylvania, and myself, and we will all be talking about the Common App, taking a question from a listener that came in. We'll have the final part of my interview with Matt Carpenter on how to use College Aid Pro to find out what colleges are really going to charge you. And Matt will share a special offer for our listeners at the end of that interview. And then we have part two of three of my interview with Martha Stolze. She's the director of admission at Beloit College in Beloit, Wisconsin, for our college spotlight of the day. And friends, remember, it's not where you go. It's not where you go. This time I'm going to get it right. That's a pound the pulpit moment, not pound the pavement, pound the pulpit moment. It's not where you go, but it's what you do when you get there and it's what you do when you get out of there. That is what will determine your career success. See you on Thursday, friends. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Matvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joy Stucker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stylianos Dimitru. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is your collegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.